The only living witness, the true story of serial sex killer Ted Bundy by Stephen G. Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth, forward by former FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood, a Barnes & Noble book, forward. Of all the infamous serial killers of the past two decades, Ted Bundy stands out as unique. Before he burst into the public consciousness, most people assumed that anyone capable of homicides, heinous as the ones he committed, had to be easily identifiable. As Bob Deckel, one of Bundy's prosecutors, put it, people think a criminal is a hunchba hunchback cross-eyed little monster, slithering through the dark, leaving a trail of slime. They're human beings. Those of us who study aberrant criminal behavior un understood that important fact. Except for certain extreme cases of psychotic behavior, sexual criminals tend to appear and behave just like everyone else. In my experience, the overwhelming majority of ritualistic offenders, of which Bundy was a prime example, are middle-class white males of European descent. Well-known examples include John Wayne Gacy, the Illinois serial killer of young men and boys, David, son of Sam Berkowitz, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, and Harvey Glattman, the Lonely Hearts Killer, whose murders around Southern California in the mid-1950s made Glattman the first high-profile high profile serial killer. All of these men were intelligent, articulate, dedicated sexual murderers, but you couldn't tell by looking at them. None betrayed himself in his daily life. Bundy's career was the most dramatic object lesson of all. He was the first coast-to-coast -coast killer, the model of the traveling serial killer who took advantage of what Bundy called the anonymity factor. He was also the first celebrity killer, a consummate actor, and a natural for television whose face and voice and courtroom demeanor were familiar all across the country. One of Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth's most valuable contributions in The Only Living Witness has been to demystify Bundy. Most of the book takes place behind the scenes in his life as they explore the complex psychology of a deeply troubled, emotionally unstable young man whose wholesome facade never before had been pierced. That Stephen and Hugh did so with Bundy's eager cooperation is testimony to their reporting skills. But the greater achievement in The Only Living Witness is Bundy's third-person ruminations on serial murder, quote-unquote speculations based on his personal experience. Not only did Bundy share with the authors a cogent and instructive reconstruction of the several developmental steps that lead to serial murder, including the early manifest manifestations of paraphilia such as voyeurism, but he also confirmed much of what my colleagues at the Behavioral Science Unit were discovering in their own interview of incarcerated killers. Although Bundy never actually confessed to Michaud and Ainsworth, he did reveal to them what is probably the most complete self-portrait ever painted by a serial killer. What he had to say is as relevant today as it was at the time, making the only living witness as unique a document as Bundy was a killer. There are lessons in this book for everyone. Roy Hazelwood, June 1999. Prologue. I last saw Ted Bundy on a miserable day in early June. The Florida sun came up hot in the morning. There was a feel of bloat in the air a rank sponginess that shortens the breath and makes the skin feel dirty, prickly. Hugh and I drove southeast from the Quality Inn in Lake City along State Highway 100 toward the maximum security prison near the remote hamlet of Rayford. Rayford. It is a 35-mile trip <clears throat> through the middle of north-central Florida, a flat, unrewarding stretch of scraggly pine trees and truck farms. This is not the Florida of Art Deco, South Beach, Disney World, and Orange Groves. This landscape <clears throat> is rural and mostly poor and has much more in common with the backwaters of southern Georgia than it does with the tourist country that begins farther down the Florida peninsula toward Orlando. We passed a convenience store that served free coffee to highway patrolmen. A bit further along the straight two-lane highway, was the town of Lulu, with its tiny post office and well-attended Baptist church, a good deal of praying and singing and stomping and hollering, in the name of the Lord goes on in this part of Florida.
On the car radio that morning, there was a choice of barn reports, country music, and gospel hours. A massive semi zoomed by. Around Lulu, the country people are accustomed to the roar of the big rigs as they barrel up and down Highway 100. They are also accustomed to the splotches of fur, feathers, and spines squashed flat into the pavement under the trucker's wheels. Buzzards and nimble crows work Highway 100 like so many 8th Avenue hookers with one eye on their business and the other on the lookout for the man. As a car or truck approaches, the scavengers fly straight up and just high enough to clear the vehicle's roof. Then they alight again on the roadway. Once in a while, the slower birds will misjudge a truck's height or fail to notice another tall truck just behind it. It was only 8.30 in the morning, but already waves of heat <clears throat> shimmered up from the highway. We turned, and the Union Correctional Institution, which is in Union County, and, oh, I mean, we turned, and the road opened up onto a broad plain. To the right was the Union Correctional Institution, which is in Union County, and then the Florida State Prison itself, just a rifle shot away, rifle shot away across the New River in Bradford County. Prison cattle stood motionless along the roadside, stupefied by the heat and the humidity. Their milk, which the prisoners consume, is often redolent of soil. Interspersed with the cows were inmate workings out with their uniform guards who cradled shotguns and wore sunglasses that coruscated in the bright morning light. It was a banal vision of purgatory. The sullen, shuffling cons toiling under a heavy sun that glinted hard at them from the keeper's shielded eyes. Stasis and timeless futility are common to all prisons and only seem more pronounced that day because of our mood. Hugh was hacking and wheezing from a respiratory infection, my brain was cottony from a hangover, and my stomach was sour from too much black coffee and aspirin. When we arrived at the prison itself, both my hands were cramped and sore from cr clutching the steering wheel as if I'd been hanging from it. For months, I had been coming to the prison to see Ted. Each time I drove up, I'd be accosted by a blue-clad trustee leaning on a rake in the parking lot, wanting to know if I was an attorney. This day, to my surprise, the importuning felons were missing, and gone too were the raucous seagulls that in the springtime wheel and screech above the prison kitchens or stand nattering at one another under the guard towers. Many inmates will swear that they are served cream chicken with suspicious frequency during seagull season. The tedium of prison life and prolonged isolation's regressive effect on personality are in large part responsible for such fears. Many convicts retreat into juvenile narcissism. They will exercise their bodies with monkish devotion, immerse themselves in dietary and nutritional literature, and spend hours in careful, loving scrutiny of their hair, their skin, their teeth, their hands and feet. Ironically, this neurotic self-absorption is fostered by an environment which, apart from the threat of violence and the influence of drugs and alcohol, is physically the healthiest that most prisoners have ever known. In some respects, a prison is a hothouse. The inmates vegetate like exotic flora. They lead orderly lives, consume a balanced diet, and are protected in their isolation from many contagious diseases and the majority of the modern world's everyday threats to psychic well-being. Much more sinister forces shape them. Convicts generally do not age as quickly as do people on the outside. Nevertheless, their health is a constant preoccupation. Some inmates at the Florida State Prison are persuaded that beef liver from the prison slaughterhouse, freshly butchered and stuffed hot from the animal into a plastic bag, is a favored masturbatory vessel among the kitchen workers. As a result, many prisoners refuse to eat the beef liver on psychohygienic grounds. More feared and gossiped about than the food, however, is the prison medical staff. One story widely credited inside the walls has an inmate being given an injection for an abscessed tooth. The needle misses and he develops an ear infection. After surgery, he goes deaf in that ear as the infection spreads to his other ear. During a second operation, the doctor fumbles with his scalpel and puts out the prisoner's eye. Eventually, the man is returned to his cell. He is deaf, blind in one eye, and missing one arm due to complications following an improper administration of anesthetics.
The swamp throng of a billion insects greeted Hugh and me as we walked from our rental car toward the prison itself. Ahead was a pastel lime-colored structure enclosed by a double row of high cyclone fences topped with razor wire. Between the two fences is an open area once patrolled by guard dogs. The fearsome-looking Dobermans and German Shepherds have been retired ever since a pair of the animals accompanied a group of prisoners on an attempted escape. Theodore Robert Bundy was among the more than 1,400 felons then housed at the Florida State Prison. He and 180 or so inmates were kept in QRSNT wings, the lockdown blocks of the longest death row in the United States. These men do not mingle with the general population of the prison. In Ted's case, that would have meant almost certain assault by fellow inmates whose rough notions of justice prescribed no mercy for so-called baby rapers. Instead, Ted and the rest of the men on the row spent almost all their time alone in individual cells, awaiting the day when, as the story had it, a guard would place a taut rubber band around the condemned man's penis, pack cotton wadding up his rectum, and lead him down to Old Sparky for electrocution. John Spinklink was executed at Florida State Prison. Ted later would occupy his cell in the spring of 1979. The day Spinklink was put to death, the popular Jacksonville disc jockey aired a recording of sizzling bacon and dedicated it to the doomed killer. Bondi was taken to death row that summer after he was convicted in a Miami courtroom for the Chi Omega killings. It was a sensational trial, the first on national television. 250 reporters with an audience on five continents applied for credentials to cover the trial. Above Judge Edward D. Cowart's fourth floor courtroom in the Dade County Metropolitan Justice Building, an elaborate media center was established to handle the crush of news people. ABC News underwrote a special satellite hookup that brought the trial into an estimated 40 million American homes. Center stage was the defendant himself, arguably the most profound enigma in the history of U.S. criminal justice. Handsome, arrogant, and articulate, he drew scores of rap groupies to the jam courtroom each day. Some were cookie-cutter blondes, desperate to catch Ted's eye. Then there were the blue-haired and dewlap geriatrics come over from their retirement bungalows along the lower stretches of Collins Avenue, hoping to catch a glimpse of the young man whom the newspapers were calling the Love Bite Killer. Here is no two-bit loner or glumping yoko with a mean streak. Ted was a mediagenic 32-year-old former law student from Tacoma, Washington, his mother's darling and a Republican of faintly liberal stripe, whose confident manner and political acumen some thought might have taken him to the governor's mansion and beyond. Yet, locked within him, or so the state contended, was a depravity off the scale of human understanding. And he was on trial for the sickening penultimate spasm of an alleged four-year cross-country murder binge that had left dozens of young women violated, mangled, and dead. Bundy, charge prosecutor Larry Simpson, had come silently in the early morning hours of Super Bowl Sunday, 1978, to the upstairs bedrooms of the Chi Omega sorority house on the campus of Florida State University in Tallahassee. There, with the agitated purpose, purposefulness of a shark in feeding frenzy, he hunted from room to room with an oak club. He fled before the urge was spent, but in a scant few minutes, two girls were murdered and two others lay battered senseless. One victim was found with her brain exposed from a blow to her forehead. He had sodomized the other dead girl with a Clairol hairspray bottle. Evidence showed that at the moment of her death, he bit at her right nipple, nearly tearing it from her breast. Then he rolled her over and sank his teeth twice into her left buttock, leaving a jagged wound. Paramedics led one st- one of the stunned survivors from her bed holding a plastic pail beneath her chin to catch the gush of blood from her shattered mouth. Then, as the police arrived at the scene of carnage, there came a report from less than three blocks away. Another sleeping co had been savaged in her duplex apartment. She would survive, but only because the furious thumping of her attacker's club had been loud enough to wake- awaken her neighbors, who frightened the assailant away. A month later, on February 15, 1978, Ted Bundy was captured in Pensacola, Florida. He was charged with the Chi Omega slaughter and subsequently also indicted for the kidnap and murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach.
a Lake City, Florida schoolgirl whom he'd abducted six days before his arrest. A jury would conclude that Ted killed her and then dumped her partially clad body under an abandoned hog shed where <clears throat> it was found nearly two months later. It was the unofficial surmise of some forensic experts that Kimberly's throat had been slit and that a knife had been taken to her genital organs. The man who committed these outrages had been regarded by those who believed they knew him as sincere, bright, often courtly around women. He had a high, intelligent forehead and a straight patrician nose inherited from his mother. Under even brows that he sometimes plucked, his expressive eyes could be a gentle blue. Together with a sensitive mouth, they created the illusion of depth to his nature. More than once, a woman used the term beautiful to describe Ted Bundy. Ted's male friends admired him. They detected a power in him. Older men marked Bundy for his solid, conventional turn of mind and his look of purpose. Several of them treated Ted as if he were a likable and deserving nephew or a younger brother. His case or cases shocked these people terribly. Long before a national audience was fascinated and mystified by Bundy's story, Ted's friends in Washington State and then Utah were incredulous at local news reports, alleging that he was a serial killer and incubus who alone and undetected had murdered untold numbers of innocent girls. At first, his supporters clung to the belief that some dreadful error had been made, yet an unmistakable pattern finally did emerge, a pattern of sudden death and sorrow wrought by a man of outward gentility and hideous covert longings. So diabolically crafty had he been in his first years of killing that what was known of the deaths was more guess and inference than anything else. From the few bones that were found, it appeared that the girls had been strangled or bludgeoned, or both. They were all young, and most of them were college girls. He often stalked them first and then approached them on a pretext. In a matter of seconds, they were gone. Only one young woman was known to have escaped him, and the circumstances of that assault suggested he silenced his prey quickly once they were within his power. He often drove hundreds of miles with their dead or unconscious bodies in his car and then stripped and dumped the girls at pre-selected forest sites. Sometimes he returned several times to visit their remains and to relive what he'd done to them. By the time most of them were found, they were totally decomposed. Their skulls, if he didn't keep them as souvenirs, as well as their skeletons, some showing telltale striations left by animal teeth, were often strewn for several hundred yards. What little soft tissue evidence was left suggested rape and mutilation. The victim's caved-in skulls attested to his incredible fury. Had Ted Bundy fit the public sex killer's the public sex killer stereotype, the readily identifiable lunatic, these tragedies might not have provoked the terror that they did. But as one of Bundy's friends later explained to me, Ted was one of us. He shattered the comfortable preconceptions about the sort of person capable of such monstrosities, presenting the world a figure both gross to contemplate and wholesome to behold, a likable, lovable, homicidal mutant. Yet, even this perception of Ted was false, or at best superficial. All it did was recognize in horror and fascination that the stereotype is a vain assumption. People, said Bob Deckel, the Florida assistant state attorney who prosecuted Bundy for the murder of Kim Leach, think a criminal is a hunchback, cross-eyed little monster slithering through the dark, leaving a trail of slime. They're human beings. But within Ted Bundy, that slithering hunchback did exist, residing behind what one eminent psychiatrist termed a sociopath's mask of sanity. The mask is a fabrication and nothing more, but it is generally impenetrable. In Ted, the cross-eyed creature lurked on a different plane of existence and could only be seen by means of a tautology. You had to infer it before it could be found. Thus, the only doctor who did not assume Ted Bundy was a killer was also the only doctor not to conclude he was mentally disturbed. Once the assumption of guilt was made, nearly all the classic criteria of antisocial personality disorder were identified and duly noted in him. Violence, disregard for truth and social norms, thieving, impulsivity, inability to feel guilt or remorse, and all the rest. But before that time, no one could see Ted's behavior <clears throat> for what it was because no one could see behind the mask. 
Ted alone and only partially understood the hunchback. It allowed him to hide reality from others and deny it to himself and to deny it to himself. It also conferred on Bundy a preternatural power to manipulate a capacity whose affect was akin to magic. It was this power that made him such an effective killer and so impossible to track down. It was a key to his two successful escapes from Colorado jails. And he used it to bind women to him. Over the years, several would be physically intimate with Bundy, happily, and many more wished they could be. He inspired passionate love and hopeless love, such as the sort felt by his wife, Carol Boone, whom Bundy cruelly encouraged to believe him innocent until just before his 1989 execution. Boone married Bundy after he was condemned to death. We helped engineer the courtroom coup and later bore him a daughter. The press stories about Ted stressed his apparent normalcy, his intellect, his attractiveness, his republicanism. They didn't report he was a compulsive nail-biter and nose-picker, that he was no genius, IQ 124, that he, was de- that he was at best a fair student in college and a failure in law school, that he was poorly read, that he frequently mispronounced words and that he stuttered when nervous and had acquired only a surface sophistication. Against a backdrop of mass insane homicide, Ted instead emerged as a variety of criminal genius a nearly fictive character, once again like an actor, who wasn't stereotypically a loner or a loser because he didn't look like one, so he must be something else, evil incarnate, the devil's issue. Even the closer profiles of him, some well-researched and one by an older female acquaintance with an active imagination, were suffused with a kind of awe at his works. Extensive articles appeared in the Reader's Digest, the New York Times Magazine, Rolling Stone, Cosmopolitan and elsewhere. Seven or eight books we've done too have appeared. All attempted with varying degrees of success to fathom the essential mystery of the man and each found a different Theodore Robert Bundy. The Killer Next Door, The Deliberate Stranger, The Stranger Beside Me, in parentheses an unintentional instance of irony, and The Phantom Prince. Each book entertained the possibility or concluded that Ted was in some way deranged. Each offered evidence of this and whatever alleged insights the author felt compelled to share. Ultimately, however, each writer had to confront unaided Ted's unlit interior realm, his Golgotha. At its edge, each was foiled as we were, as we were, that is, until until the day we met the hunchback. Hugh and I followed a torturous route to this confrontation, a journey that began in 1978 with a call from Kathy Robbins, my agent. Kathy told me that Ted Bundy, the noted alleged murderer, wanted to tell his story in a book. At the time, I was working for Business Week magazine. Years before, I had covered <clears throat> several murders and kidnappings while working for Newsweek magazine, most notably the 1973 Houston, Texas case of homicidal pedophile Dean Coral the notorious candy man, who with two young accomplices tortured and murdered as many as 30 small boys. Serial killers, however, were hardly my forte. After some reflection, I called Hugh in Dallas, where he was then based as chief investigator for the ABC News Magazine 2020. I had worked for Ainsworth in Houston when he was the Newsweek bureau chief there. He had assigned me to the Coral case, through it and several other stories, Hugh taught me a good deal of what I know about reporting. Given the sheer complexity of the Bundy story, unlike other such crime sagas, it stretched across both time and geography and would involve reporting in several states. Hugh was the perfect partner. His repertorial experience with criminals and cops extended back to the Clutter family murder case, Dick and Perry and their 1959 slaughter of the West Kansas farm family that Truman Capote turned into his masterpiece in cold blood. Ainsworth covered much of the bizarre story for UPI. Without much hesitation, Hugh agreed to take on Ted's story with me, both of us unprepared for where it would lead us. The first surprise was mine. Ted, it turned out, had grown up not five miles from where I was raised. We had a number of mutual acquaintances. Moreover, we were both born in Burlington, Vermont, Bundy in 1946, I in 1948. While still quite young, both of us were moved by our mothers from Vermont to Tacoma, Washington. In 
Ted at the time was an only child. I was the youngest of four. Neither of us knew his natural father, although unlike Ted, I was born within wedlock. We both attended Tacoma Public Schools, were swept by the same local fads, later drank the same regional beer, and knew the same kinds of girls. We were both blue-eyed and of the same general height, weight, frame, and coloring, and we were both left-handed. I once ran down these curiosities to my sister Susan. Well, have you ever killed anyone, she asked. No, I said. She laughed. That's what Ted says. Thanks, Sue. Ted contended that he was a victim himself of incompetent defense attorneys, poisonous pretrial publicity, and manipulated evidence. He said he was caught in a monstrous tangle of circumstance that had led him from a life of promise and public spirit to unjust prosecution, imprisonment, and three death sentences. He was, he said again and again, innocent. There had been disturbing elements in both his trials. Eyewitnesses waffled and were vague. The scientific evidence was at times equivocal and produced sharply differing opinions among the experts called in by both sides to testify. No fingerprints were found. In fact, in the dozens of cases from Seattle to Florida in which the police have sought to implicate Bundy, there was not a single bit of physical evidence that incontrovertibly demonstrated his involvement in anything more sinister than car theft. This question of evidence, we would learn, was Ted's personal test of guilt and innocence, part of his complex mental apparatus that turned contention into belief, flimsy rhetoric into creed. We would soon have to deal with that. <clears throat> but in the beginning, Bundy regaled me with stories of his boyhood. He had once fantasized being adopted by Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. His academic career, he thought about going into law enforcement. His loves and his frustrations. His memory was acute for details of his jailbreaks, the uneven course of his schooling, and his involvement with Washington State Republican politics. He spoke of his attorneys, his judges, and his juries. Ted recounted tales from the eight lockups he'd been in and shared the thousands of letters he received. Nuns, mental patients, housewives, lawyers, groupies, all total strangers, wrote to Ted all the time with offers of salvation, sex, money, friendship, forgiveness, and abomination. A man identifying himself as a medical doctor suggested that he and Ted switch brains. Another wanted to know if Bundy would agree to be put under suspended animation rather than electrocution. The idea was for doctors to harvest organs from the unconscious Bundy as needed, and for him to be available for vivisection experiments as well. Bundy felt this sort of material was sufficient to our purposes. In some ways, he was his own most avid fan. He envisioned an exciting, gossipy book with naughty details, just like the best-selling books about Hollywood celebrities. He did not want to discuss guilt, except to deny it, and he actively tried to dissuade Hugh from investigating the cases against him, ostensibly the main reason for working with us in the first place. We were of a different mind. The content of the book, as far as we were concerned, would be determined by what we learned about Ted and not just what he wanted us to learn. We talked with him not just as his biographers, but also as licensed private investigators attached to his prospective appeals attorneys. In that capacity, we would have been pleased to demonstrate Ted's innocence. Instead, Hugh and I quickly concluded that Ted was every bit the killer his prosecutors and the police said he was, possibly far more successful at serial murder than any of them realized. Our minimum victim count was 21 girls. It seemed possible that he killed twice that many. In view of that, we had no interest in producing the gauzy, self-serving narrative Ted desired. <clears throat> Yet Bundy had nothing to gain by confessing to us. He had been twice tried and convicted of murder. He knew he was guilty, of course, and that nothing we would write would in any way prevent his ultimate date with old Sparky, probably at least eight years away. When I tried to turn our death row conversations to substantial issues, he hedged or lied outright to me. Not only did he have nothing exculpatory to offer us, not a single credible alibi for any of the killings, or even a supportable interpretation of the known facts, but he turned the interviews into a game of shoots and ladders, 
pleading a faulty memory at times or lapsing into long, impenetrable silences. <clears throat> Hugh and I soon wearied of this and actively began to consider shutting down the project. Yet we had over the weeks taken note of two behavioral clues, distortions in Ted's personality that suggested a novel avenue of approach. Emotionally, Ted struck us both as a severe case of arrested development. From all that he said and all that Hugh had learned of his past, he might as well have been a 12-year-old, a precocious and bratty pre-adolescent. Whether a cause or a consequence of his condition, this apparent emotional retardation resulted in a diseased child's mind directing the actions of an adult male body. The second clear signal we saw was Ted's profound capacity to dissociate. He was a compartmentalizer and a superb rationalizer. His mind was a maze of walls. This, we would learn, was a key to understanding his entire bizarre mental edifice. Taken together, the emotional immaturity and power of compartmentalization, we felt, could explain how Ted could live with while also denying his homicidal acts. It had required weeks to reach this level of understanding, which we achieved just as we were about to abandon Ted to his fantasies, his conceits, and his bizarrely selfless wife. However, in light of this new perspective, we decided to try one last stratagem. The childishness was so extreme that we were reminded of youngsters who will deny wrongdoing, even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. An example would be the crash of a picture window breaking and the discovery of a baseball on the floor within. Outside the shattered window stands 12-year-old Johnny, baseball bat in hand. Johnny clearly knows something about the shattered glass, but so fearful is he of taking blame that Johnny will stonewall any questions, adamantly insisting he knows nothing. <clears throat> However, if you can eliminate the confessional eye and instead ask the young boy how he thinks the ball was propelled through the window, he might grasp that opportunity to tell the truth obliquely in a way that, to his immature mind, he is not actually accepting responsibility. Bundy himself even had proposed such a protocol at the point in his legal proceedings when possible plea bargains were discussed. Ted had suggested he simply be sent away for the balance of his life, a sentence he'd accept without further legal battle, so long as he did not have to say, I did it. So we pre repackaged that proposal. Why, I asked him, couldn't he speculate on the nature of a person capable of doing what he had been accused and convicted of doing? The word confession didn't arise. I reminded Ted that no one knew as much about the case as he, and for legitimate reasons. He had vast first-hand knowledge gained by virtue of being a suspect in all the killings, as well as his background as a former psychology student, plus, of course, his intelligence. <clears throat> Ted agreed to think over the idea, an immediate indication that we had guessed right about him. The next day, I returned to the prison and found Bundy more than just amenable to the idea. He embraced it enthusiastically. This was March 27, 1980, the, the day I first met the hunchback. Ted leaned forward in the tiny prison interview room, lit a cigarette, and grabbed my tape recorder, which he cradled in his lap. At first, I didn't understand what he was doing. In an even professorial voice, Bundy began to speak of themes in modern society, violence, the objectification of women, the disintegration of the home, anonymity, stress. When I interrupted, he shushed me and told me to be patient. This was going to take a while. Ted at last turned from sociology just to specifics and began describing the killer. Within, quote unquote, this individual, he explained, there dwelt a being. Ted sometimes called it an entity, the disordered self, or the malignant being. The story of its beginnings came slowly, chronologically, a consistent tale of gathering sociopathy that nurtured itself on the negative energy around it. Occasionally, Bundy would entertain a question, but for the most part, I was there to pay for lunch, light his cigarettes, and change the tapes. He was cherry on specifics, C-H-A-R-Y, I don't know definition of that word, and skirted in many cases where I guessed he feared that one slip could provide a vital link. Bundy had no interest in being prosecuted for murder yet again.
yet protected by his use of the third person, he forged ahead in detail to explain how thoughts on sex in general came to concentrate on sexual violence, how the entity used pornography to shape and direct itself, how the sickness within drew Bundy toward ever-increasing shows of violence, and how the killer managed to mask his disordered self from his unsuspecting intimates. As Ted familiarized me with his private bed lamb, he took pains lest I develop overly simplistic impressions. He wanted me to understand to the extent that I could. The killer did not suffer from a split personality or schizophrenia, he emphasized. It is truly more sophisticated than that, Ted said. He called it a hybrid situation, a sociopathology in which the entity was both in and of the killer. Not some alien presence or second self, but a purely destructive power that grew from within. The several psychiatrists for whom we later played these tapes unanimously agreed that there was no doubt that Ted's descriptions were autobiographical. Critical elements of the third-person narrative could only have been drawn from first-person experience. Not trained to look for these keys, I still never doubted that Ted was telling me his story. When the hunchback emerged, the creature spoke directly to me. Some of Ted's revelations came wrapped in metaphor, others he described with clinical detachment. But the common thread was Bundy's own sense of discovery as he struggled to put the ineffable into words. It was as if in the telling that he too was seeing the hunchback's genesis for the first time. How do you describe the taste of bouillabaisse, he asked rhetorically. Some remember clams, others mullet. What a strange comparison. He insisted that violence was never an end in, in itself, that the sex was almost perfunctory, and that to the extent it was possible, the victims were spared pain. Not that the entity was moved by any humanitarian impulses. It was just that gratification lay not in the assault, but in possession, the key to understanding Ted. It was increasingly clear that a child's mind had directed this homicidal rampage. The fantasies he described were crude, more typical of what you'd expect from a misinformed 12-year-old than an adult. There will always be a question as to how early in his life Ted actually became a killer. He did sustain several adult sexual relationships at the year, same years he was also killing, but as Bundy explained to me, the disordered self, the thing inside Ted that impelled him to kill, knew his victims through a warp of twisted perception. Only by means of his astounding capacity to compartmentalize had Bundy been able to keep the hunchback from raging through the mask and destroying him. When at last it did, Ted became the hunchback. No longer its protector, he and the entity fused. I felt I was encountering a wholly novel form of derangement. Rather than being overwhelmed, defeated by his illness, Ted appeared to be inhabited by it. The two men and man and hunchback interacted. Above all, I saw elements of will, conscious will, taking part in the creation of this entity, as if Ted had wanted to become a killer. Seeing this, knowing this about him as we sat knee to knee in a cramped and sweltering cubicle, buried in the middle of a prison, I myself began to dissociate. A wall, a necessary wall of dispassion went up in front of me as Bundy spoke in a low voice holding the tape recorder close to him and darting glances at the guards who periodically looked in on us through a glass pane in the door. There were times of intense concentration when his features would freeze and a distant stony quality came into his voice as if the hunchback had taken corporeal form. More than once, a horizontal white line, like a welt, appeared across his right cheek it fascinated me because it didn't follow the contour of his face at all. It was as if an invisible finger were digging a nail into his skin. I wasn't frightened at these moments, fearful for my own well-being, at least no more so than I am at the sight of a shark cruising around behind aquarium glass. Far more disconcerting were moments such as the time I pressed Ted for an explanation of how a victim was subdued, <clears throat> Bundy laughed heartily and remarked, You too, Steve, can make a successful mass killer. I really think you have it in you. Like it or not, I was bound to him, if for no other reason than Ted had allowed me to see the hunchback, taking me into his inner world. 
Such distilled horror, once seen, never leaves you. After many weeks of this, I could absorb no more. It was Hugh's turn. In the coming months, Bundy would edge closer to an outright confession than he did with me, but not before the two of them fell to snarling at each other. My role had been to go easy on Ted, befriend him, let Bundy dictate the pace, maintain control. Hugh played hardball, and Bundy was not at all happy with Ainsworth's intolerance for elliptical thinking. What gratification would there be in having intercourse with a dead girl? Well, a perfectly reasonable question when Hugh posed it to Ted, who performed all sorts of sexual acts with dead girls, Bunny was manifestly displeased. Hugh, for his part, was constantly wrinkled by Ted's weary sighs, meant to convey his lofty impatience with his plain vanilla gumshoe. He dogged dog, dog Ted with questions, derived from my interviews with Bundy and Ted bridled. I'm not going into that, he would say. This is already too thinly disguised. I've gone further now than I wanted to. But that was to come. On that steamy June day in 1980, we walked with our briefcases toward the main gate and under the gaze of a guard holding a rifle high above us in the watchtower. We passed through an external sally port in which one gate must close before the second one opens. After the inner gate creaked open and rumbled shut, a concrete walkway led to the double doors of the prison entrance itself and behind the doors to a small waiting room, I mean a small waiting area. There we were, greeted by a man at a glass enclosed control panel. His name was John Batwell and he was a 12 year veteran of prison employment. Mr. Batwell was responsible for checking our briefcases and identification. Generally, this took about 10 minutes, time enough to adjust to the prison's incessant clangor and time enough to glance over the sports pages of the Gainesville Sun, which only rarely was not folded neatly on a shelf inside the booth. John Batwell was thorough. Routine had not dulled the sharp interest he took in our belongings, even to the point of politely asking to see the innards of our tape recorders. He always asked to see my private investigator's license, despite a first-name familiarity. Never did he fail to compare me with my license photo and physical description printed on the front of the card. Next, we approached a third barred gate and prepared to pass through Boutwell's metal detector. Chains, pens, belts, keys, shoes, and even my glasses had to be removed. The age machine could still be set fine enough to register the coin in a penny loafer. Accompanied now by a guard, we walked through another clanging gate and proceeded down a long yellowish tan corridor with the linoleum floor waxed and buffed to a constant high gloss by the inmates. The walls were bare, and were it not for the constant sonic assault of the of banging metal gates echoing in every direction, this part of the prison could have been mistaken for some functional and well-maintained wing of a municipal building. Up a few steps and through another gate, controlled by yet another prison employee in another glass enclosed booth, we arrived at the center of the prison, a four-way intersection called Grand Central. To the right, we could see through floor-to-ceiling bars the cell blocks, opening onto either side of a long, spacious hallway. At the end stood old Sparky behind a locked door. Straight ahead was the prison laundry. And behind us were the five lock gates made of a specialty steel so hard and costly to manufacture that many states couldn't afford to use it in in prison construction. A crowd of inmates, mostly blacks on their way to work in the prison laundry, walked past us in silence. None appeared older than 21. A white prisoner who had killed a cop was led in manacles by a guard who seemed half asleep. We turned left toward the colonel's office, a suite of rooms, also protected by steel gates, from which the colonel oversaw prison security. Two of these rooms each fitted with glass windows so that their occupants could easily be observed or set aside as conference areas for inmates and their attorneys and or investigators. It was necessary to reserve these rooms days in advance. Outside the colonel's office stood a bright yellow wire cage. Seated within it were seven inmates. Six were young blacks wearing blue prison-issue dungarees, 
which signified they were from general population and would not necessarily be spending the rest of their lives in this place. The, one, the white inmate wore blue dungarees too, but also an apricot t-shirt over a gray sweatshirt. He was accustomed to the Florida heat. On his sockless feet were green plastic thongs. Hey, homeboy, Ted called to me as usual. Where have you been? He was affecting a heavy southern black accent. Ted had been waiting in the cage for more than two hours. Generally, I could tell within a few minutes whether it was going to be a productive day with Bundy. Any of a number of things might be going on with him. He could be depressed, stoned, angry, distracted, or simply dull. This morning, Ted was listless and grouchy. It was not likely to be a good day. Have you seen Carol? he asked. This was a recurring sore point among us. Ted's wife lived on the edge of poverty in Gainesville, from where she 